Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. I am your host, Zach Bitter. I have an exciting announcement to make. I am offering a chance to win a free 30-minute consultation with me. Entering is very simple. Just share an episode on any social media platform, tag me, or send a screenshot to hpopodcast at gmail.com. This is important because if you don't tag share with me, I may not see it and be able to enter you in the raffle. You can enter as many times as you want. There will be a winner announced during the show intro at the beginning of each month. I appreciate all the listeners who have participated in this so far. It really does go a long way in helping me grow the show when you share the episodes you like with your friends, family, and followers. Also, a new way to enter the raffle is to submit a show review on your favorite podcast platforms. Other ways to support the show is you can head to the show landing page, which is just zachbitter.com forward slash HPO. There you will be able to find access to the show Patreon page where you can actually access shows early and ad free by subscribing to the show on Patreon. You can also donate in other ways on that landing page, as well as access the full catalog of episodes, descriptions, show notes, and transcripts if you're interested in diving into some of the previous episodes. I do want to give a quick shout out to my Endurance Training Simplified series of episodes. It's gotten quite long. So I listed them in the show notes. You can link to each one of those there. But if you're looking to start your endurance journey or just really fine tune it, I have a whole series of episodes that deal with just training principles in general and the different components that go into it between like easy running, speed work with short intervals, long intervals, long run development, the mental side of training, all sorts of different stuff. So check those out in the show notes if you're interested in refining your endurance training. If you'd like a little bit of extra support in your training, I'm actually launching a new coaching package. So this new one is actually a group training process that is online. What it is, is if you subscribe to it, you will get access to my full catalog of pre-made endurance plans, which range from 5K up to 100 mile come in multiple levels in multiple different durations. And you have access to that as long as you're subscribed. So if you decide to train for a specific distance or event, all you got to do is let me know. And I send you the copy of that particular training program. But what comes with it is what is important in my opinion is when you're subscribed to this new coaching group coaching package, you will also be able to attend a weekly meeting with me and the other group members where we will cover topics that I find important for your endurance training journey, as well as questions and schedule adjustments that you have submitted beforehand. And then also some live questions from the group. The group size is going to be limited to 30 though. So make sure you sign up soon because I will be starting this program before the end of 2023 to make sure people have access to this by the start of the new year. You can find information on that by just heading to my website at zachbitter.com or linking to it in the show notes. Supporting the show this year are my friends at Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. I have full descriptions about how I use both of these products in my training and racing at the end of the show. So if you're interested in checking that out, please stick around after this episode. For now, just some discounts and promotions from both of these products. Element Electrolytes is offering a free sample pack with your first purchase. Just go to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO. They have a no questions asked money back guarantee if you are unsatisfied. They also just released their warm beverage winter collection, which now includes raspberry chocolate. I just checked it out. It will be in my morning coffee protocol this winter. Delta G Ketone is the exogenous ketone company that has almost all of the research behind its formula. They are trusted by professionals around the world. You can get 20% off with code bitter to zero, just go to delta G ketones.com. There you can also sign up for a free consultation where they will help you understand how their product may fit best in your lifestyle. And then you can compare it to mine. Links to both of these products can be found in the show notes, as well as the show sponsor landing page, which is zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Brian, mm-hmm. thanks for coming on uh, the podcast. Yeah, it's good to be here. Yeah, it's a fun fun time of year with the running event here in Austin. And now having this podcast studio, it'll be cool. You can kind of get an extra 
group of guests coming into town that maybe weren't here permanently that you can chat to, including yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, I come every year. I was doing the math and I have been to every single running event since 2010. So it's just like yeah. an annual pilgrimage for me down here. So you, if you hit the 10 year mark for TRE, that means you've been in Orlando at least once, right? We did do Orlando once. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And then, and then of course, COVID, uh, mm -hmm. they didn't do oh, that's COVID, right. but, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so. It was, someone was telling me the reason it's in Orlando is because the convention place they do TRE in has a 10 year like cycle with some, I think it's some cattle organization, uh, something yeah, like that. I, I always think for some reason someone said John Deere. Oh, maybe that's what but it is. But like, I, I can't remember, I don't know related. exactly, but it's something like that where it's like every 10 years they have to move somewhere <laughs> else and send it somewhere else. They did Orlando the once and then happened during COVID that, that. Yeah. 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 They couldn't do it. Yeah. Well. Here we are. Here we TRE. are. I know. I think a fun topic to talk to you about before we get into some some footwear stuff is ultra fishing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Since this podcast is, I mean, this podcast has kind of a health and fitness spin to it. Obviously, I'm an endurance athlete, so it trends that direction a lot too. But you have an interesting hobby that you like to do that involves a lot of movement, but also fishing. Tell us a little about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, this happened about the time I was starting ultra, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even a little bit before I was dappling into fast packing mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I had my first kid and then, um, was, you know, decided to start a shoe company and I was really struggling to fit in family life work mm -hmm. and then backpacking, which is something I'd been doing my whole life. And so I found this little rod um fishing fly fishing rod because i'm a passionate fly fisherman yeah and i started going in about 10 15 even 20 miles into the mountains and i would fish once i got there and then i'd run out so i'd get a 20 to 40 mile training run in uh -huh. and you're up in these high alpine lakes and so you can catch an insane amount of fish and yeah. it's just unbelievably beautiful and so it kind of turned into a thing i coined the term ultra fishing and that's just something i've been doing for close to 15 years now uh, you know, it's it's hard in Utah. It's it's really kind of a summer thing. It's like July, August, September time frame. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I really enjoy doing, and people seem fascinated by it. And I think it, it's so much fun because you can fit a five day backpacking trip in a single day when you're running, and you can catch when you get that far in. I mean, those fish don't see a lot of of flies, right. and so you can catch 40, 50, 60 fish in a couple hours. It's just yeah. an absolute riot. So it doesn't got the pressure of the local pond or <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So um, it's something fun that I've been doing for a long time now. And uh, it's really fun. So if you ever come out in Utah in those months, I'll, I'll yeah, take you up there. That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, I got to do that. It's I, cool. I spent a while since I've done any like real fishing, but when I lived in Wisconsin, we would do a lot of like river smallmouth bass yep. fishing yep. and largemouth, uh, and you know, all the traditional kind of lake fish, walleye, northern pike, yeah. musky. So I have a background, not as thorough as yours probably, but it's been something I want to get back into. It's, I, I've, there's a couple things like hunting and fishing are two things I did, did stuff, did get into when I was living in Wisconsin that I just haven't been good enough about kind of reintroducing as I've moved around a bit. But, um, Nicole and I are committed to staying in Austin for a long time versus moving anytime soon. <laughs> there so you go. I feel like I have to establish those two hobbies back into my life now that I can count on it being a routine that will have have some structure to it without thinking of leaving the best spots that you develop over the years when you're somewhere a little longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and you're kind of you're, you're I mean, you're still so fit, Zach. And and I've these last few years, I, I have not been training as much. And uh -huh. so fishing has taken up more of my time as my competitiveness has decreased. So the ultra part eventually, goes eventually the you're going to become human. I mean, I'm <laughs> Jeff Browning is trying to argue that and prove us wrong yeah. in that. But at some point in time, I bet you could fit it in if you want, even here in Austin, Texas. I yeah. Know there's some, some stuff, but, um, uh, I love fly fishing and I love just being outdoors. I, mm -hmm. I'm a really passionate advocate for, um, nature and for spending time outdoors. And so even though I'm running a lot less miles now, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not competing at ultras. I'm, I've, I only ran one ultra this year. Uh, usually I'm doing five or six, seven ultras a year. Yeah. And so now that I'm not doing that either, neither the racing, the qual quantity or the quality, um, I'm able to spend a lot more time fishing, which is, which is a great hobby just to be outdoors, mm -hmm. uh, much like running just a little bit. Yeah. I'm a little bit calmer from yeah. in my, in my, as I'm getting older. Has, has any of your family members gotten into fishing too? Or? Oh yeah, all my kids. Yeah, I, mean, I got my three kids and I finally got them to my favorite ultra fishing lake. 
Uh-huh. Um, it's 12 miles in, and it's my favorite one. The fishing's always so good. It's just this beautiful lake up in the Uinta Mountains up in northern Utah. And we did um, a four-day backpacking trip. So it took us several days to get in there. And I took them there this summer, and it was an absolute riot. Yeah. Um, you know, so my kids, my my son, ready for this? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, he's 13 years old, had his first 100 fish day. Wow. <laughs> That's how good these lakes are. And yeah. I mean, they're all like these you know, pan size, you know, brook mm-hmm. trout, but I mean, it's just unbelievable. So, uh, my kids get into it. My wife will fish with me occasionally. And my, my, my kids, all three of them, um, love to fish with, with dad. So your, your fishing availability has, is slowly increasing <laughs> as right. the family gets into it. That's always the trick. Which probably. is fun. Yeah. Which yeah. is fun. And I, I, I'm pretty good about it too, with my kids that, you know, if we do go fishing and the fishing's not very good, we don't sit there and grind move it on. out. We yeah. move yeah. on, right? We go do something different and something fun. And so it's, um, they, they enjoy fishing with dad, I think. So. Yeah. It, Utah is still kind of one of those like semi sneaky mountain states where Shh. it, yeah, I've checked my mouth shut where it, yeah. <laughs> it's not it's, like, it's found out, but yeah, it, it is still like the population density isn't what Denver is. Right. Um, and the mountains are very accessible. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's a really wonderful place to, to, to be and to live and yeah. the fishing's very, very good good spot to be an outdoorsman I'm sure that's right one of the interesting things about what you do with that that kind of made me want to talk about that along with just kind of the relative interest of it is one thing I've seen in ultra marathon running and now it's even just endurance sport in general is there's this bigger wave of people getting into the sport that sort of came from something different so for you like well, I mean, you were, you were kind of maybe an exceptionist, but there was someone who's like, if they're a fisherman and then they realize, oh, I can get way better fishing if mm-hmm. I'm fit enough to get mm-hmm. out into those spots that are really hard to get to. Yeah. Or the hunting community has been a big one where, yeah. and I see this a lot from my coaching where I'll have people reach out about, you know, training for something and I'll ask them, well, what's your background? You do the whole like intake stuff and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a backwoods hunter and a lot of times it's like Cam Haynes or someone yeah, like that who yeah. kind of really pioneered, I think, that type of uh, an approach where, Hey, if you're going to be going similar to what you're fishing stuff, but with, with the hunting angle, they're not just sitting up in a deer stand. Like I was in Wisconsin, they're actually going out miles and miles into the back woods to, you know, find whatever they're hunting for. And that requires a skill set of fitness that is pretty well maintained with a running background. If you have it, there's so, a lot of those in Utah. There's mm-hmm. a lot of the ultra marathoning crew are, are hunters and, and go out hunting. And I'm actually reversing that. Mm-hmm. So my goal next year is I've never, I've never hunted in my life. Uh-huh. Um, but my wife and I are really trying to eat a, extra clean and sure. we live in a great hunting area. Um, and so I'm, that's one of my goals next year is actually to get into hunting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we'll see. So I'm, I'm the opposite direction of that, but I have seen that as well. Uh, we've seen a lot of that. And even with ultra, um, there's certain groups that have adopted our shoes and th- that, that endurance hunter is someone mm-hmm. is, is a person that has adopted ultra quite, quite a bit. We've never really s- sought that out. We've never advertised for it. Um, the yeah. through hikers, you know, for people hiking from, you know, Mexico to, to, um, Canada. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we're the number one shoe. So it's kind of fun how all the, the life and everything kind of just intertwines itself into each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fun topic. I know let's jump into that because like ultra has been around now since 2010 is the technical date, right? Well, we launched the brand in early 2011. Okay. So we mm-hmm. showcased the brand. Um, we were basically a Ponzi scheme in 2010 <laughs> um, at, here in Austin, Texas. It was, we were three guys in a basement and yeah. we had no money. We were literally like trying to write orders to showcase to investors to order us shoes. We, we uh-huh. had no money. We hadn't launched the brand yet. Um, and we, we got 16 orders at the running event in 2010. And we took that to an investor and he was able to, to purchase our first round of shoes, which launched in April of 2011. But yeah, it's been, I mean, 12 and a half years and it's since launching the product and it's, we've, we've gotten surprisingly big. It's been yeah. fun. It's been a crazy road. It has. Yeah. I've been fortunate to, obviously you're the man to talk to one of the three, probably in terms of kind of having an inside look at ultra footwear from the very beginning to everything that goes into getting to the size it has today. I've been along for the ride for a while. This is my 10th year as an athlete. It's amazing. Worked for the company for a bit in the middle there right. too. And it was like, so I have some perspective as well, which is why I want to talk to you to about some of this stuff. But so when you start, like, so you're at TRE, you have essentially a concept mostly. Yeah, we is, had some prototypes. Some prototypes. Yep. And is there like a number where you're like, we need to get, like, because an order, 
I'm guessing ranges from the number of purchases per order. Is there like a number of shoes you're like, we have to hit this number or we can't even send this in to make it realistic? Yeah, we, we, we worked with the factory to say, hey, what would be the smallest possible order you would consider? Uh-huh. Um, and they said a, a, basically a, a, a half of a container of shoes, which is about 33,200 pairs. Okay. So our first order was was 3,200 pairs of shoes. That was the okay. minimum mm-hmm. one men's, one women's, one color only, 3,200 mm-hmm. pairs. That's kind of the minimum. And now okay. that's from a small factory. Big factories won't even, they won't look, even, at, look, they at won't even look at that. But yeah. the factory we were working with was kind of a small, fun factory, and they worked with us, and um, and it was awesome. But yeah, our first order was, and we sold out in three weeks too, which is really cool. Nice. Yeah, shocking. We that were, helps, we were I bet. blown away <laughs> as we kind of built up to the launch, and all of a sudden, three weeks into it, we're out of shoes, which was, which was pretty wild. Mm-hmm. Does what kind of feedback did you get in terms of who was the original customer? I think the original customer. It's an interesting group. I think it was very much minimalist centric, yeah. mm-hmm. but our concept itself wasn't minimal. We had the same four foot cushioning of every other brand. Yeah, you know, we started by hacking off the heels of our shoes. Mm-hmm. Right at the at the time, pretty much every brand on the market, the heel was twice as high as the four foot in the midsole. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, twelve twenty four. Right, that's, that's right in the midsole, and then you add you know five millimeters of of the sock liner, five mil, four or five mm-hmm. millimeters of outsole. So it's like, you know twenty two millimeters of stack height in the four foot, thirty four in the heel. Mm-hmm. Right, it's pretty standard with the twelve millimeter drop. And so our sh- first shoe we launched was a 22 millimeters of cushioning in the forefoot and, you know, and, mm-hmm. um, with, with zero drop our, our coin, our, our term that we coined. And so we had, our, I think our early adopters were very minimalist. Mm-hmm. We are, I think weren't as minimal as maybe some of the early adopters, but that's who really broke into it. They were the people who tried out the, ba- the barefoot shoes and they were just like, that's fun for a little bit, but this isn't realistic if right. I'm running a marathon or if I'm running long distance or if you start out for the first time. Yeah, it's interesting because it seemed like at that point, kind of in that, in that time frame, actually, there was kind of a minimalist movement that yep. came through. Yeah. And kind of a wild time, in my opinion, because the way I describe it to people is like, you want strong feet, yeah. you want strong Absolutely. lower legs. And like the goal should be to get to a race or an event or a project with as strong a lower legs as you can. And then like obviously putting a shoe on on top of that can be very advantageous because now you kind of have like a really strong lower leg foot. And now you also have this 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 item that is gonna hopefully get you a little bit further yet. Yeah. And where you go from there is usually the question with footwear is and what kind of item is going to extend that, that race day. But then there's also the training. So you have to have a, a, a product that's going to allow your foot to get to that point in the first place. But it's sort of like when the minimalist movement came through, it was almost like people decided, hey, I'm going to get strong and I'm going to go and I'm going to meet up with this like professional strength athlete, power lifter who's been doing this for two decades and just jump right into their routine. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> no, it's not going to work. Yeah, you kind of have to start out like at a different spot. And from my perspective, that's kind of where ultra sort of slid in, where yeah. you'd have like your your barefoot minimal issues that had been on the market to some degree and then got a little more momentum from books like Born to Run yeah. and just the minimalist movement. But then there was like sort of that wave of people jumping into the deep end, so to speak, finding out you can't do that. <laughs> yeah. And then figuring out, well, where is the where's the balance here between continuing on in my traditional running shoe, traditional hiking shoe, and getting to where I want to be or find that like sweet spot and ultra sort of fit that middle territory. Absolutely. Really well. We always said we're the we're the benefits of both. Right. Mm-hmm. We're the benefits of traditional footwear because there is a level of cushioning there, same amount of four foot cushion, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you also get the benefits of the minimalism in terms of the zero drop, the foot shape, a little more flexible in the shoe and so forth. And um, backing up even further, um, Golden and I, you know, Golden was mm-hmm. one of uh, the co-founder with me and, and he was kind of some of the initial like brains behind it. Like it was a lot of his concepts. He's the one that coined the term zero drop and started hacking off the heels. Mm-hmm. But even before that, we went to the trade show in, uh, I think it was 2004, 2005, outdoor retail trade show in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. Big, huge trade show at yeah. the time. And we saw for the very first time the Vibram Five Fingers. Mm-hmm. And they were selling them as boat shoes <laughs> with the siped outsole. And we said, hey, we're from a running store. Could yeah. you?" And they looked at us like we were crazy. <laughs> and we brought them in. We were the first running store in America to bring in the Vibram Five Fingers. And the, interestingly enough, we were as we were selling these Five Fingers, we never once recommended or sold them alone to somebody mm-hmm. it was always an add-on sell oh yeah right it was mm-hmm. hey you know after your run go put these on and maybe do a 
quarter mile, half mile cool down. That was something we used to do a lot. Uh, we met the first day of high school, Golden and I, at cross country practice. Yeah. And we would finish all of our runs barefoot on grass. Mm -hmm. um, kind of do strides and a little cool down, warm up on, barefoot on grass. So that was something we always kind of believed in. But it was never of this is the end all be all. It was this is a strengthening tool to get your feet stronger so you can handle those longer miles, handle that marathon and so forth. And so when we initially launched ultra that was very much the benefits of both that was one of our kind of t of terms it was never the minimalism's the end all be all it was the hey there's great benefits to minimalism mm -hmm. right and there's great benefits to traditional footwear were the middle ground between the two and when born to run came out in 2010 we had basically had the samples done but we couldn't find funding Mm. And we were sitting there pulling our hair out going like, no, we have the solution as the whole barefoot thing was just exploding. We were looking for funding at that time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, 2009, 2010 were not great years for funding um, post recession right. there. That's and so, right. yeah. yeah, it was rough, but uh -huh. we made it. Yeah, we made it. So you sort of had like you had the, the, the customer base that wanted it, but there was kind of a gap between being able to actually produce enough product in the right kind of framework for them yep. given the, 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 the economic landscape. So is it something where, I mean, I've, n nothing's perfect in terms, well, I mean, I guess probably some companies probably have like just everything work out at the right <laughs> timing for, for you would have been more advantageous to have been like a couple years earlier then do you think? That's, that's or a good question. I, I I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I don't think so. I actually think we almost there was this demand as people were trying minimalism. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people were turned off of it because of the unsuccessful stories. Oh, but see. there was yeah. enough stories, so we were able to kind of really sweep in and, like I said, all of our early customers, most of them had tried a barefoot shoe previous to trying Ultra, mm -hmm. and so it was really well timed to be honest with you. You know, and plus you can always look back and wish you'd done things differently and we'd made all the mistakes you could imagine. Yeah. But I think in terms of launching at the time, uh, people were hungry for something new. And I think if we'd launched a couple years earlier, I don't know if there was a consumer base that would have been interested in Ultra. I think that barefoot swing almost needed to happen mm -hmm. for us to be found right in that middle middle ground of the two yeah. worlds. Yeah, for, for me as a runner, you know, the interesting thing about Ultra was I think the, maybe the most interesting thing was the foot shaped toe box. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I had been running, let me, th I'm trying to think this would have been the first time I put on a pair of ultras would have been in 2011, I think. Well, that's when we launched the yeah. instinct. It was the instinct. Or maybe it was a bit after that. It would have been the, okay. So look, maybe, maybe you can help me clean this up. Yeah. So the, here, here's my experience with ultra footwear or how I got introduced to the brand. So I did my first ultra marathon in 2010, 2010 second one a year later in 2011 but then I did three of them and then I was sort of in this spot where I was like okay I really like this I want to take it more seriously I got to figure out where the differences are here versus what I've been doing which mm -hmm. is just kind of you know high school and college track and field some road races and things like that and there was a store revolution natural running company yeah up yeah in Wisconsin yeah so you you've yeah, probably, I've been, I've been inside probably, of it yeah okay yeah yeah I've they probably there. were an early customer they I were very think. much so yeah. yeah they lit so my parents house is literally like not even a mile maybe half oh, a mile oh really from yeah, yeah I know right where it is mm -hmm. so I can't remember how I got connected with huh. them but I got connected with their owner and went in there and he he introduced me to born to run mm -hmm. he was like this is kind of a cool concept you might be interested in like natural running Kind of the same philosophy as what you were describing where there's like, obviously there's, you know, a process here. It's not just grab and go. Yeah. And he sent me out with three pairs of shoes and one of them, I, th I'm pretty sure it was the first superior. Yeah. Would have been first superior. Yeah. 2013 early. Okay. So was it that? Okay. So maybe it was a little later than I'm thinking. Yeah. Or maybe I had a different pair. Maybe I did. You no, know, I think I had a, okay. So maybe it was 2013. Uh, that might that might make sense early actually. 2013. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that actually does because I wore that shoe with. Um, I think I had a pair of like Innovate uh, shoe, like, like the 290s. Or yeah, something like, something that. like that. Yeah. that. And then a pair of like he gave me a pair of like Vibram Five Fingers mm -hmm. or something like that. So I sort mm -hmm. of had like the spectrum of like minimalist up to what the original superior would have been exactly like what you described, where it's like, it's got some cushion there, yeah. but it's balanced cushion, zero drop. It's got the foot shaped toe box, the, the ultra kind of picture to things. Yeah. And I remember like rotating those shoes 
And then, uh, yeah, I had my first, like what I would consider successful ultra marathon to the degree where like any shoe company actually cared what I was doing <laughs> in 2013. So that actually makes sense from a timeline standpoint. Cause I think that's when I got connected with, with you guys at ultra. And then, then you sent me the instinct 1.5, I think. Sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. Which was a pretty big shoe for ultra. Wasn't it? Didn't the instinct 1.5 oh, it was huge for us. Yeah. yeah. That was really the shoe that, that launched us. Um, it was hugely popular. Mm -hmm. It was a great shoe and we botched the two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally botched the two. <laughs> that shoe was a lot of fun. But that 1.5 was yeah. amazing. That instinct intuition 1.5 was, it mm -hmm. was beautiful and it ran so well. You know, it was, we, we did great with that. It was an awesome shoe. It really took off that with the Lone Peak 1.5. Yeah. Um, same mm -hmm. original outsole as the ones. They just had updated uppers, which I think was part of the, our weakness early was some of the, the materialization, some of the color schemes. We, we hadn't quite dialed that in yet, but that those 1.5s were really, really awesome shoes for us. And we, they, they took off in 2013 was a really good year for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, ultras hurdles I'm sure there was a lot of them given that you're just that different. Anytime you're different, you have all yeah. sorts of hurdles. You got to clear. Yeah. You also get a cult following, which is kind of nice. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. We, we got that, which is great. <laughs> the, the, I would say like of the early shoes, the, the instinct intuition probably was a little more aesthetically pleasing maybe than some of the other products on the line mm -hmm. at that time, which sounds kind of silly when you're talking about like functionality, but the way it looks on a shoe wall sometimes is what gets you your first yeah. impression kind yep. of a thing. And that can be a difference. Um, yeah, so let's jump into like, I, I think it's interesting cause like ultra got really popular on the trails Yeah, before it uh -huh. did the road more or less, but the instinct is a road shoe. Yeah, so our first shoe we ever launched was a road shoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the, so that was still probably a minimalist mindset type of person or a natural footwear type of person, or were you getting like road runners that were like, that's a cool shoe. I think that, I think that trail runners, particularly at the time, mm -hmm. the trail running was still pretty small. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, Golden and I were both fairly competitive trail runners. I was really at the peak of my ultra running career in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And so I was really racing a lot, running a lot, all on trails. I, I think we, we love the trails. And so we were able to take a look at trail shoes and really, like all of our shoes, be very different and very distinguished. And I think that the trail running community is just more open-minded. Yeah. Um, I think they're willing to take more risks. <laughs> I think, like, the, they're not as aesthetically... Um, uh, minded, they don't mind something a little rugged, a little ugly. They don't really care. I think road runners are a little bit more habitual, mm -hmm. right? They like their routes, they like their splits. Trail runners are a bit more free, and so I think it was more of the culture of trail running that 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 bought into ultra more than anything else. And it's been amazing. I mean, we still to this day are, um, you know, number three most used. Uh, brand at UTMB, you know, the largest race, mo largest, most popular race series in the yeah. world. We're always back and forth with Hoka in terms of who's larger at run specialty in America. So it's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it is interesting you say that. Cause I want to say just even with like one of the hurdles to get over is obviously that, uh, that balance cushion. Yeah. You have the traditional 12 millimeter offset. Yeah. And I remember like the trail the trail side of things and the through hiking community didn't seem to really mind that though. Yeah. Not to any large degree relative to the road running community. Do you think that's just because of the, you, I mean, the culture that you mentioned, what about just like the variability of that terrain? Uh, it, it, you're, you're right on. It's absolutely the variability of the terrain. You know, if, if it, most injuries are going to be repetition injuries anyway. Right. And so, you know, trail running, you, there's less of a repetition because every footfall is uphill, downhill side, yeah. you know? <laughs> and so that variability, um, decreases, you know, that that impact transient that that kind of comes down and, and and makes people's calves sore and so you know you don't get as sore in our shoes for a newbie uh, on the trail as you would on the road and mm -hmm. so i think that that very much helped as well but i think the initial purchase was hey uh, trail runners are more open they're more trying something new and different and then when they did try it they didn't get the lower calf soreness that the road runners did mm -hmm. and so that that benefited us hugely and uh, our trail shoes are, are really good too. I mean, it helped that we looked at things very differently with the sandwich stone guards. Mm -hmm. um, the way we constructed the shoes was different in that toe box and those long races, like you said, that yeah. foot shaped toe <laughs> box. I hear it all the time. Oh my gosh, my no blisters, my feet are so relaxed and comfortable. So it all just kind of, it's a combination of things and we're really proud of our trail heritage, our trail running um, shoes themselves. And um, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And they're all, oh, by the way, all of our trail shoes are named after mountains in Utah. Yeah. Initially, yeah. yeah. The Lone Peak, Olympus, Temp is named after Mount Timpanogos, and then, of course, Superior Yep, um, is, a, is a mountain right above Alta uh, Ski Resort. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool to, to have that kind of, like, historical, like, little, like, name tag thing with uh, where the origins We, we branched are. out with the Mont Blanc, right? That's true. But but we but did Mont Blanc. <laughs> we, 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 it's not, not in Utah. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually, you have to start. As a, it's just a sign that the brand's grown. That yeah. You pick a different mountain outside of Utah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, too, with kind of just the idea with footwear design is... I mean, you have a foot shape, which is you're changing the shoe enough at that point where I think people think, oh, cool, I have more room for my toes. That's a huge win. But you also have to be mindful of like, how does that aspect of the shoe change the rest of the shoe? Mm. So, or maybe not change the rest of the shoe, but make your foot behave differently in the rest of the shoe. So when you started, you have, I mean, just for cause, or people who are listening who are not very familiar with like shoe terminology, like a last, it's essentially the cast yeah. you build around yeah. the shoe or, or you build the shoe around, I should say. And what was the, what customer was maybe the hardest to get to fit and appreciate that foot shaped toe box? I think people, I, I, I think people just fit their sh- shoes too small and too tight. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the feedback was, oh, these shoes are so sloppy. Yeah. Right. And it's in, and so we're, we have to battle that mm-hmm. a lot in terms of, Hey, we want it to be a little more loose and relaxed, right? We're going to mm-hmm. use positive terms here yeah. <laughs> instead of the negative terms. There's, there's a pros and cons to everything. Right. And so that consumer that is used to just getting their shoes too short, mm-hmm. right. Then they cinch up their shoes really tight. Um, th- that, that was who we, we had struggled with. We still do struggle with that a little bit. And we, so we had to make different lasts, right? So we have our original last, which is a little bit roomier, a little wider. That's the Lone Peak is still on it. The Olympus is still on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we launched the superior with, um, um, a little bit of a snugger last and it's not necessarily less wide. It's actually just less volume and width and volume are two separate things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the superior is actually a slightly snugger last than what's on the lone peak. And so we had to kind of adopt that. And that, that standard last, we now call it the standard last. Um, we used to call it the performance last. That is now what most of ultras are built on at this point. Yeah, that you you preempted my next question, which was basically like early on, you probably can't really have a lot of variety with lasts because you sort of mm-hmm. have to like, you you have to stick with what you what you have available to you from a funding standpoint, yep. from a just a catalog standpoint. But then as you get bigger, you can start addressing different parts of mm-hmm. the market in a little bit of a better way. So what I thought was an interesting like, yeah. when Ultra got to the point where they're like, okay, we can make essentially a setup where we have these three distinctly like these d- different lasts so that we have someone like what's similar with everyone everyone has feet everyone has a foot shape the difference is the volume of the foot right okay. so someone with a like a high volume foot is going to maybe want a different last than someone who's got a low volume foot and my experience with ultra was it was always harder to get somebody to buy in if they had a low volume foot correct Yep. So the funny thing is the original ultra customer was probably somebody who was maybe skewing a little bit more towards, I want that extra volume, Correct. that extra room. Yes. So you introduce a slim last and it's like this one customer, the, the customer who normally had a harder time with ultra is like, finally, we have something. Yeah. Then you get the, the original ultra. You have to explain to them like, all right we still have your option here. We just have a bigger catalog. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I've had like the whole sellout comments and things like that. And it's just, you know, it's interesting because we're just trying to broaden the audience, you know? And I think that there's not a cookie cutter for any, for everybody, right? Everybody's different and everyone has different preferences. And I think as we've gotten larger and larger, Ultra's really tried to, um, a stay true to who we are. And we have, I think through our foot shape and, and, and our zero drop. And then also, um, expand those offerings, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's, you know, I think our original consumer was more minimalist and well, we now make maximal shoes, yeah. right? We still yeah. have really high cushion shoes. Um, we have various lasts. Um, we've recently introduced a drop mm-hmm. to the shoe for the first time. We have a shoe with a four millimeter drop, uh, which has been received incredibly well because a lot of people had tried Ultra and they just said, I couldn't do it for whatever reason. And so I think Ultra has just had to evolve um, and expand and address really consumer wants and consumer needs, but while trying to still stay true to who we are. And, you know, our purpose statement is we spent days just arguing every single word, but our purpose statement <laughs> is unleashing human potential by inspiring the world to move natural. And mm-hmm. I think that's 
what we try to do through every single model. We're trying to unleash, right? Do something different, right? And we're trying to really unleash human potential, whether it's your first 5K or a 100 mile race or the now these 200 miles races that are popping up, right? Um, and we're trying to do it in a really positive way. Um, I, I really believe in that positive mindset and, and thinking positive and thinking outside the box. We want people to move, right? It's not about running, it's about moving. Mm -hmm. And then of course we want them to do that naturally. And I think that that's something that uh, we've done from day one. I think we're still doing that to this day. Uh, maybe not quite as pure as some of the, the diehard original shoe that we launched, but I think that's something we, we do talk about as a brand internally and something we still try to believe in in everything and try to do in everything we do and believe in. Sorry, that got a little. No, little I think it's interesting <laughs> to me because like I have my perspective being with Ultra for quite a while, relatively speaking. Um, again, anyone else sitting here, I might have the upper hand on like longevity and inside information. But since you're a founder, I have no n nowhere near that. So it's fun to hear your perspective. My thought is like always. I like options, right? Yes, and I think, exactly. yeah, options give you the opportunity to reach a larger audience and then also give someone the platform to explore within your brand. Yes. So like you don't introduce the ultra forward experience. And then we have a situation, you have a situation where people have to explore outside of the brand if they don't get to a point where they're really wanting the original ultra shoe at first. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And I think, one thing that's fun in today's footwear world that wasn't there in 2010 um, is options, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, every brand, they were all the same. They were just arguing about their cushioning systems. My wave is better than your gel. My gel is better than yeah. your wave. My <laughs> wave is better than your hydroflow, which is what Brooks was using, right? They were engineering wise, they were the same. And now you're looking at brands, obviously Ultra has pioneered it. Um, Hoka has been comp completely dominant in this category as well. Looking outside the box on is it with, is a recent, uh, really popular, a lot more popular now. And you've got all these brands that are providing options that just weren't there 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think Ultra wants to continue to do that, right? We want to continue to innovate. We want to continue to do things different. We want to expand our options and our opportunities. And, you know, if you like that original Lone Peak, I mean, we have two shoes in that category. Because what we did with from the original, we split the original Lone Peak into two shoes. Mm -hmm. The Lone Peak 2 and the Superior, yeah. right? And so it's like you now have options, and those two shoes are still there. You can still buy them. They're still pretty darn similar to they were 10, 12 years ago, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We now offer widths. If you really want more more width in, our, in your sh more space and volume, we offer multiple um, widths in Lone Peak and Torin and Paradigm. And so it's exciting. I think you're right on. People want options. People want something new and different, but they also want um, – trying to stay the same and finding that balance is difficult. It's been hard as a brand. We've made a lot of mistakes, but mm -hmm. I think we've done a pretty good job overall. I'm interested in just kind of the brand or the, the, the line expansion to some degree because you had widths, right? Like eventually like you add a shoe to the line that isn't just like on that last, but it also has just a wider. So you get almost, it's almost like the highest volume of foot Yeah. now has an option for them. At what point were you getting feedback from customers saying like, we want widths. Was um, that pretty early or was that something that took a while? It did take a while and, and widths are an interesting story because our ultras don't fit on a typical width scale, right? Mm -hmm. People are saying, well, how do ultras fit? And, and we've tried to simplify that, right? With foot shaped, um, that, hey, we let your toes splay and so forth. And so it already feels wide to most people. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that's interesting is when you get that much material in our with that roomier toe box, there's a lot more material there. Mm -hmm. And so it flexes differently than most, most brands. So we've had some durability issues on the upper because of our toe box. And so then you have to put overlays. Well, as soon as you put an overlay on, <laughs> now you don't have as much space. And so people say, oh, you guys aren't as wide as you used to be. And it's like, well, it's the same last. We have not changed the last. Mm -hmm. It's just we put overlays on because we have durability issues. And so how do you find that balance, right, of, of making shoes as durable as possible? but also letting your feet be as natural as possible. And it's a really hard balance. And so that's where we said, hey, we're gonna need to put a few more overlays to address some durability issues. But for the consumer that still really wants that extra width, because the materials tend to flex and move, we're gonna now offer offer some wides. And it's been very successful. We started with the Lone Peak. We then did it with the uh, Torin, which mm -hmm. is our number one selling road shoe. And then recently we've done it with the Paradigm. The new paradigm has it. And the paradigm, a lot of the reason we've done it with the paradigm is we've worked very closely with the medical community. Mm. We're approved by the American Podiatric Medical Association. We have a lot of doctor referrals. And the paradigm's, uh, I think, 
very good for a first timer or for someone that's coming in traditional footwear. And a lot of it is those insoles are really taking a lot of space that orthotics and insoles that, oh, that yeah. doctors and podiatrists build. And so a lot of the widths also accommodate those a little bit better too, that are, um, have more space. So we offer it in three models right now. We probably going to have one or two more in the near future. Right. And so, um, we're just continuing to expand and listen to our consumers and adapt the best we can. And we've made a lot of mistakes. Don't get me wrong. Like I can go back over the 12, 13 years, <laughs> like, Oh, we screwed up this shoe and Oh, we messed up this and Oh, that mesh wasn't as durable as we thought it was going to be. So we've made a lot of mistakes, but at the same time, I think that, um, you know, I'm still on, on the leadership team. I was the president for a long time, but now I, I focus more on strategy and PR and, um, We've made a lot of mistakes, but I feel like we're heading a really good direction right now. Uh, we've gone through the acquisitions. Man, those acquisitions are brutal. Yeah. We went through two <laughs> acquisitions, which were like the worst years. Oh, so, but I feel really confident about where Ultra is now. And I think that the next five, 10 years are going to be really good for us as a brand. Yeah. Yeah. That is an interesting thing. Cause like, you know, you have, and this is most companies that keep growing eventually as a founder, an original founder you bring in outside, well, you bring in outside funding almost no matter what, but yeah. you eventually get purchased and then you've stuck with the brand throughout the different acquisitions and things like that. But what does that feel like when you, maybe even originally when you have this sort of a first acquisition, is there like, is it like I'm sending my kid off to college? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first acquisition, I think it was, um, I mean, we were so broke. We'd, we'd, I mean, uh, we got in a pinch and I had to mortgage my dad's house. Yeah. I mean, it was like, it was this relief of weight off your shoulders. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, finally, like I actually am going to get a paycheck for the first time in two years. Yeah. So it was a relief. And then it was, and then, you know, a year or two down the road, you're like, man, they're not listening to us as much as we <laughs> wanted them to. And we had to learn, right. Yeah. And I had to learn that, Hey, um, you got to prove things out. Uh, I think we were a little willy nilly at first. We were dreamers, you know, we were entrepreneurs. Yeah. And so when you start getting ownership in, you start realizing that, that, that money and, and that time and that energy and the investment, you, you got to get a return on the investment and you mm -hmm. have to prove that out. And yet we had to think a little deeper in terms of the strategy. And that was hard, you know, cause we wanted to do what we wanted to do now, that very entrepreneur drive. And so the owner, the, you know, the other acquisition was a big acquisition. That was a big company to a big company. And that was really hard too, because they bring in their new people and all of a sure. sudden these new people have new ideas and, and trying to find that balance between the original, founding principles and people that come in with new ideas mm -hmm. and neither of which are bad, right? They're both good. We like new ideas, but we also, how do we find that balance? And sometimes we've done good. Sometimes we haven't done as well. And so it's difficult. It's, it's hard emotionally because the second acquisition is exactly what you called it, which is like sending off your kid yeah. to college. That's it. That's how I describe the second acquisition. The first acquisition was like, finally, I'm going to get a paycheck. We actually have like mm -hmm. an investment. Hallelujah. Right. It was a celebrate celebration. The second one was very much a, well, off to college. I hope you make good decisions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I still get to, you know, I still, like I said, I, I, I'm involved, um, from a top, top down, up, you know, uh, from the leadership team, but at the same time, I'm not in the offices. I work remote. And so, um, having that influence without much control is very much like sending off your kid to college. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah eventually might, they make their own decisions. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And luckily, like I said, I'm really excited about the, the strat, the three year strategy that Alter has right now. I think it might be the best strategy, uh, Alter's ever had, frankly, in terms of the plans, the build outs, the time and energy that has gone into it. it I really am excited. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that this episode's sponsors are Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. You can get a free sample pack of Element Electrolytes by going to drinklmnt.com forward slash HPO and 20% off your order of Delta G Ketones by going to deltagketones.com and entering promo code BITTER20. Yeah, it's almost one of those things where early on you have ultimate freedom because yeah. you're the one calling the shots. Mm -hmm. Like the, the buck mm -hmm. stops at your desk, which comes with its worries obviously like you said like mm -hmm. if you make a mistake it could mean i got to go home and tell my family that uh we have to go a different direction and <laughs> i mean that's not that sort of pressure yeah. i mean i can't imagine like i mean i can i can i guess relate to some degree like working for myself i appreciate the idea the freedom and the ability to kind of maneuver and if i have an idea that i really get excited about i can sink more time into it but there is that that pressure of um, yeah, you don't have that guaranteed paycheck. You don't have that mm -hmm. sense of like kind of uh, scaffolding around you that you would, th that I had when I was like teaching or doing things where it was more of a kind of a, a structured, like I work for this place. 
type of a mindset. So it is, it's just a different, there, it's like, it's like anything you get, there's the, you, you sacrifice some things to get the comforts, but you also sacrifice a little bit of the, the freedom and flexibility to get them as well. And it's, it's just, uh, it's just different, but it's, it gives you options too. Cause now you're probably thinking like for whatever freedoms I did lose in that scenario, I also now have a lot of new options I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And that gives you opportunities to probably be creative in areas where you just wouldn't have been able to do before. Yeah. I, and I also think that, you know, Golden, Jeremy and myself, the three, you know, founders of the brand, um, we didn't do it to try to make a ton of money. Obviously, like money's great. It, it motivates us and mm -hmm. so forth. But at the same time, like our motivation was that the running industry wasn't changing. It wasn't evolving. It wasn't mm -hmm. doing what we wanted as runners, right? As retail mm -hmm. managers, we were working retail. Uh, we didn't have any money. Um, and so the C that the industry now, the average sales, so, uh, running shoe being sold at run specialty, is like seven millimeters. Yeah. That's yeah. five, mil five, six millimeters less than it was, right? Th these mm -hmm. are awesome changes that we have absolutely swayed the entire industry. And I think that that's really satisfying and really gratifying. Um, but when you get that ownership, um, they, they care about one thing, yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. money. Right. And so it's like, how do you blend this balance of, of hitting your revenue numbers and hitting the profitability targets that you want while still like trying to be a dreamer and change the world. And, um, I think Alter has done a really good job of balancing that. Not perfect, but given our circumstances, I, I'm really proud of, of what we, the choices we made, why we made the choices. Um, it's, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but it's been, it's, it's been a roller coaster for sure. Yeah. It, it is interesting to see the running market change and be able to see that like, this was something I know ultra directly impacted. I mean, you just even, you even see foot shape, more yeah, foot shape options absolutely. out there. Absolutely. And I mean, they're uh, bigger brands that are now like, they're not quite as pointy. Look at a shoe 10, 15 yeah. years ago that were a, a lot more pointy oh, in a lot of cases than yeah. they are now. They're rounding them out a little bit. <laughs> absolutely. And it's awesome to yeah. say, you know, Hey, I, I put my stamp on the world, you know, right. for, a, for the, for, for the, for the better. Mm -hmm. And I really believe in the concepts. Right. And, and when we say foot shape, I think people ought to say, well, what does that mean? The biggest part of our foot shape right, is engaging the big toe. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part of our entire thing is, is getting that big toe to be able to engage. When you engage that big toe, it locks the arch of your foot like an archway, yeah. right? When you, when you disengage the big toe, it's almost like twisting an archway, right? It becomes very unstable. So engaging the big toe does the same thing that naturally what arch support would do artificially. And so, you know, there's so many benefits um, to it that, that, are so nuanced that people don't fully understand. We have to be careful, um, you know, to prove out a lot of these things, but it, it's, um, it's exciting, you know, and that foot shaped toe box is awesome to, to allow, especially the big toe. Yeah. Big toe is the most important one of, of all those. It's big for a reason. Of, yeah. yeah. It's big for a reason, right? <laughs> it, it is. It's stability. It's, it's relaxation. It's locking the bones of the foot. There's so much that goes into it. So it's really cool. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you about too, cause it's, just an interesting aspect, I think, to the, the footwear business is you don't, I think people maybe think like there's all these little things that you can just micro adjust and then you make this perfect thing that hits your vision exactly the way you wanted it. But there's a whole business model and a rotation and an update like kind of timeline that occurs. So like when someone goes to the store and buys a shoe, that shoe had been like in the works for years. Years. And, yeah. and even when you get like, what's the timeline? Like, like when you get your first prototype of like, say an update to a shoe, how long is it usually before that actually hits the shelves? Uh, initial prototypes or no, just like, let's say like, like if you get your very first and again, you're going to get upper wraps first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you get a runnable, a semi runnable prototype, mm -hmm. you're 16 months before it launches, mm -hmm. right? The shoe has to be done hands off six months before a shoe launches. Like you can't make a change. Mm -hmm. Like there's no change to be made six months before a shoe launches. So you're planning two year, 24, 26 months out conceptually. Mm -hmm. um, you kick something off, you know, formally you kick it off at 22 months, takes you six months to get all the details and you get upper poles and they, they'll get to send you the midsole tooling that you can tweak and play with. But it is a lot that goes into it. Yeah. And so when you screw up a shoe, 
um, you can't change. I mean, it takes years to to address those issues that come up. And so when we've when we failed on shoes, it, it is gutting because it's put you back two years. Yeah. Um, you know, and as a brand that's only been out 12 and a half years, you know, um, we're our, I think our rate our success rate is pretty high um, yeah. to get where we, we, we it has to be. Um, uh, but it is very difficult. It's not nearly as easy. If it's easy, everyone would do it, right? right. It's, yeah. it's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. And we've put our heart and soul into it. Yeah. And, and I'm sure there's a certain level of, uh, just, you get that last prototype before, you know, you have to send it off and you're just at that point, you know, this is what's going to go to market and you put it on your foot, just hoping it feels the way you want it to feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, through the prototype, you, we usually have a pretty good idea, uh -huh. you know, six months out, we know if it's going to be, we know kind of a range, yeah. right. Um, where you're like, okay, it might not be exactly where we want it. So we're not going to order as much inventory. Oh, I see. right. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you could, we're not going to promote it because we know that, Hey, it's not quite exactly where I want it, but it's good enough to launch. Like mm -hmm. we feel like, Hey, if it's, we've had a lot of sh shoes and prototypes, by the way, that we've never launched, mm -hmm. you know, or we've delayed launches and we've prototyped shoes and get to a point where like, it's not ready. We're not going to launch it. Mm -hmm. um, other times we got to a shoe and we're like, it's still a good shoe. It's not great, but we're still going to launch it because it's a good shoe. If it's a timeline, we, we've got to hit our timelines and our financial goals. And so you launch a shoe knowing that, Hey, it's probably might be a B minus, but we're not going to market it. Right. We're not going to put it in as many doors as, as mm -hmm. we might otherwise want it. And all of a sudden on that second or third iteration, you start fine tuning it and you get better. And all of a sudden, um, you get shoes for us like an Escalante or a Torrent or yeah. a Lone Peak that like, they're pretty dialed right now. Yeah. I mean, they're really good and you might ebbs and flows on certain models. Um, you know, right now I, I'm, I'm testing the Lone Peak nine right now. Uh -huh. I've been testing it for months and it doesn't come out for. 14 months, you know, and I've been testing it for the last four months. Right. Yeah. So it's like, and I'm all pumped for the Lone Peak nine, but the Lone Peak eight hasn't even launched yeah. yet, you know? And so it's hard. Like all of a sudden I hear I'm in the podcast telling this, but it, you're that we're thinking that far out. It, yeah. it takes a lot of time and effort and energy and money, um, to launch a shoe, let alone a whole brand of shoes like we have. Yeah. Yeah. I want to zoom out a little bit with just the running industry is in general because i just think of just you're thinking of your own brand's philosophy and your customer base but there's also this whole greater running like market that is shifting and adjusting mm -hmm. over the years and you have to start sort of operate within that loading zone to some degree if you mm -hmm. want to maintain yep, absolutely one of the biggest things i think that has changed since i started running was the uh the the uh, super shoe yeah so we went from having a scenario where on race day the lower the firmer the lighter you could get the better performance you're going to get out of your footwear to almost a complete opposite where yeah. now we have to regulate how high you can stack a shoe on race day because the more you stack essentially the better return you're going to get out of that new super shoe technology yeah. so i just try to think of it through the lens of like a brand of okay, we had, we kind of built our catalog to some degree around how do we prepare? I mean, obviously there's more than just racing included here. There's just people who run for fun and who where like you said, like the, the paradigm has a medical component mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. But generally speaking, it's like when you're thinking of like how you're going to structure your lineup, you also are to some degree, what is someone going to wear at the end of the day when they're going out to the race they're preparing for? Mm -hmm. And when that shoe goes from something that is maybe as small as you can get it, get away with, and everyone's be different there. People are going to race in max cushion shoes before super shoes, just because that's what got them to the finish line. But how much does something like that change just the catalog in general when you have a, a big shift in the market like that? It's, it, it's huge. And if you're not prepared for it, you get left flat footed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, ultra, because these shoes really are mechanical advantages. I mean, that, that's, yeah. I mean, that's what they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what, how much mechanical advantage is too much. And as a brand that has kind of pr prided itself on doing things naturally, like our purpose statement, where's the blend, you know, our, I think we've, we did a really good job with our original vanish carbon shoe mm -hmm. where it had more flexibility to the shoe. Um, we have the new vanish carbon two coming out here in March. Um, which I, it, the performance is absolutely fantastic, but where is mechanical vantage and how much is too much? And, you know, we got a little, you know, it's been hard. How do you keep up with these trends? Mm -hmm. You know, um, the pendulum swings all over the place and you have to be, um, uh, malleable as a brand or it's going to get left flat footed. And that the super shoe thing is a huge, I think it's going to get bigger. I don't know about you. Yeah. I think in the next two, three years, it's going to have to. Uh, 
they already are regulating it. Mm -hmm. And where is that regulation going to come? I'm, I'm not a big fan of heavy regulation, but at the same time, you, these are mechanically advantage, advantageous shoes. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, the, the research on them is good. It There's, is. Yeah. There, it, it's not, this isn't just fluff. There is real and legit research taking place on these foams and these carbon plates and it's real advantage mm -hmm. might only be two percent maybe it's four percent i don't know but the six percent eight percent what how much you know yeah i mean it is there it is it is quantifiable it is you it's it's interesting and and i it scares me to be honest yeah yeah L I, less as a brand i think ultra will be we're gonna be sure. fine but it personally uh, it's kind of like a Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, like, well, how much is too much here? Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're talking about like a portion of the market. So from like a brand standpoint, it's like, yeah, we need to respond to this, but it's also not necessarily like, I don't think there's going to always be like, if you think of your greater customer base, there's always going to be room for like different shoes than super shoes. But when, when you get to racing, it's, it's like you said, there is a, a performance mechanical advantage with yes. that. E even yeah. the lower performing options out there. And some of that, I think, I think the biggest issue I have with it is there's a, a range from one person to the next where mm -hmm. like, Agreed. if we both put on the vanish carbon or we both put on like another super shoe, one of us might get 4% and the other one might get 2%. One of us might get six, the other one. Correct. Might so when you think of like the pointy end of the performance spectrum, that's the difference between being on the podium at the Olympics and not being on the podium in the Olympics. Absolutely. If you're a high responder versus a no yeah. responder or a low responder. Yeah. And so that does change the sport to some degree, not just the marketplace, I guess. Yeah. And it, it I think we talk about it in terms of elite athletes. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, a recent study came out and it's 90 plus percent of the cells oh, yeah. are going for mid to back of the Packers. I mean, oh, this, this is not this is not just for the elites. These are for people who. I need my PR. Yeah, yeah. I need the Boston, need Boston. qualifier. Yeah, yeah. Right. These are that is also where it comes into play. And so the the wave of cells of super shoes, historically like track spikes and things like that, that's your percentage of cells is tiny. Mm -hmm. These super shoes are actually moving the needle mm -hmm. for the first time in racing shoes. It's not just about the elite athletes. It it is quantifiable. And so your mid pack runners are very, very interested. And so, you know, as as a brand as Ultra, you know, I think we have a really good solution. It's a great shoe, but it, 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 it has motivated every brand has had to up their game in terms of midsole foams and carbon. And particularly, a lot of people think it's the carbon plate that produces the benefits. It's the interaction between midsole foam and carbon plate mm -hmm. um, with a rockered forefoot, right? All of those things factor into those performance updates, and every brand has had to go... Oh crap! We yeah. got it, it's it's let's get our R and D. We've really got to do some advanced prototyping. Um, it, it's it's cool too because you're looking at all these great new foams, yeah. and these carbon plates. There's a lot of it, coolness and excitement. But um, I think every brand has had to step up their game in terms of research um, and advanced prototyping and um, trying to be ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. Which again, competition rises all boats, right? So I mean, it's it's. It, it, you're going to see a lot of cool midsole compounds yeah. coming out, not just in the super shoes, but there is going to be a trickle down in terms of the other, um, other, other standard shoes. Yeah. Yeah. You actually said something interesting there where it was my description. Actually, when you get to racing shoes, I guess maybe the big difference here is you went from having a wide spectrum of racing shoes between someone who's like, well, I'm not going to train myself to be able to tolerate a racing flat. So I won't wear one on mm -hmm. race day Correct. to where now the way these shoes are built, everyone yeah. can kind of use, like the first person, the last person can sort of get away with the same shoe, regardless of how they, I mean, you want to wear those shoes too, just to get used to them to some degree. But like, generally speaking, you're a lot more likely to say, take a super shoe, go to a race and not have an experience that just the shoe is like problematic for you versus I've been running in max vision shoes and I'm going to put on this racing flat and go and run a marathon. That may end a lot worse for you. And you may not have that option available because of that. Yeah, it is wild. When you and think and, about it. and the the revenue implications are quite large. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the everybody is buying these shoes right now. Yeah, it's not. And they don't last as long either. So they it's don't. Like, and they cost they more. They cost twice as much, and they last <laughs> half as half. Long. Yeah. yeah, if you're lucky, you get half. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it is. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. And I have seen the pendulum swing from, you know. Pronation shoes. I mean, eighty percent of the shoes on the market fifteen years ago were pronation stability shoes. Yeah. To Everybody in the everybody in their dog wanted a vibrant five finger or a Merrill barefoot yeah. <laughs> to you know max cushion to super shoes. I mean, and that's all in fifteen years. Yeah, uh, it, it's amazing how 
um, the evolution and, uh, of footwear is and the industry and the marketplace. It's, it's not easy to keep up with, by the way. It's hard. Yeah. Um, I, and like I said, I'm proud of how we've done it, but it, it's, it's difficult. It's mm-hmm. difficult. It's hard. Is it much harder now to entertain having a minimalist shoe on the lineup because of that too? Since I, cause the way I think about it is like in the past you could sort of say, all right, we can sort of double dip here with a racing flat and a minimalist shoe yeah. because they sort of have the same characteristics versus now racing shoes are just not minimalist shoes anymore. So can you even entertain that and say like, this is a, or does it just depend on the market that you're working with? To some yeah, degree? I think it depends on the market and it depends on, um, you know, priorities, mm-hmm. right? I think ultras always our main shoes are always on that mid-level cushioning um mm-hmm. you know our best sellers have never been the max shoes our top line of top selling shoes have never been on the lower spectrum mm-hmm. you know we make a shoe the escalante racer and it's uh, you know it started kind of as a traditional racing inspired escalante yeah and now the average runner running in is not racing in it right it's, right. it's a more, more of a, almost a minimalist trainer it is that's um, why i wear it for, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, i'm wearing them right now yeah um and it's one of our top selling shoes on our website mm-hmm. right um, we don't have a huge wholesale distribute distribution there um but we sell it really well we have a new one coming out next may i'm actually wearing next year's model escalante racer 2 all right so um <laughs> you know something we get to showcase here in austin texas for the first time yeah is this escalante racer too too, the update to our um, one of our longest standing shoes. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, in terms of the minimal shoes, I, I think the market's pretty small there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think with our uh, with our key accounts, that's not what they're requesting. That's not what they're asking. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, we still make you know things like a Superior and an Escalante Racer. Um, but our top sellers are definitely in that Lone Peak, Timp, and Torin um, mm-hmm. spectrum. And then the new uh, drop shoe has done really well for us too. That f- the forward experience. Um, which again, four millimeters is tiny, by the way. And, yeah, you're gonna um, feel the rocker. We've had that. that. I mean, we've had people requesting that shoe for ten years. Mm-hmm. Hey, I tried your shoes. I yeah. just can't do the zero <laughs> drop. You know, we did. We we prototyped transition insoles that would actually have like like yeah. wedges with stickies. Yep. To take, and we never launched that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've talked about doing it for a long time. We launched a few months ago, and it's the reception's been huge. So, again, always have to evolve. You always have to look at what are your consumers requesting? What are your key retail partners? What is your brand brand philosophy? And how does all that blend and move? It's, Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a delicate balance and it's not easy, but I think we've done a pretty good job. Yeah. And and maybe just given the timeline that we talked about with shoe development, stuff like that, it plays into this, but if, is, is something, if you could go back and do something differently in the Mm -hmm. early days, do you think adding a drop shoe as like a transition shoe would have been something you had done earlier or is it so. the right time? I think, I think this is the right time to be honest. I, I would have rather done it a couple years earlier, mm-hmm. uh, but we went, we had some prototypes um, and some designs back from like 2018, 2019, mm-hmm. the 2019 was our big acquisition year. So we had oh. a huge acquisition. Yeah. They moved the, you know, big acquisition, big dollars, a uh, big company, publicly traded company bought us, moved the company from Utah to Denver. Yeah. And then COVID happened. Yeah, there's that branch <laughs> And too. so it was like, we basically lost like two years of prototyping and advanced mm-hmm. de- development. So I, I don't know. I, didn't, I don't think we should have done it 10 years ago. I wish we would have been able to do it two or three years earlier. Mm-hmm. But given the, our acquisition, the move to Denver, and then COVID, um, it is what it is. And this is when it happened. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There was the whole like disruption in the supply chain as well as i'm sure just the manufacturing process as a whole was probably problematic so you weren't probably doing a lot of new things inside that frame or inside that window of time yep Yep. yeah there's all sort of outside forces it's it's, i like talking (laughs) about this though because i think like listening to it if i put on my like non I know what's going on in the shoe industry hat and put on my like i'm just an average runner out there wondering why they don't make the shoe i want yeah Hearing this stuff, I think it kind of resonates to a degree in where it just kind of like, says, okay, I get it now. Like, I know I want that shoe, but it's really unrealistic for me to be asking for it because of this. Or yeah. if I do ask for it, I have to be patient because, first of all, there has to be a market for it. It can't just be me. And second of all, it has to go through this long iteration of development yeah. And prototypes. Well, yeah, and you get with parent companies and, and you know, not – if you work for a big, large parent company, you, you, you're going to understand this uh, more What in, in any 
industry, right? Mm -hmm. Is that there's going to be years where they're going to invest in you. <laughs> oh, and then yeah. there's going to be years where they're like, Hey, we're pulling back from investment because X yeah. brand over here isn't doing so red hot. So we need you to profit more this year. I mean, uh -huh. those are the things that ultra has to deal with. Yeah. Some years we're going to get more investment than other years. Other years they're like, Hey, we need, you know, we need more profit. Other years it's, Hey, here's a bunch of money. Go, yeah. grow, grow. Right. And so we're as a, as a brand that grows every single year, right? We, we always have, have grown and we're continuing to grow. Um, I battled that where it seems yeah. like every other year it's, Hey, here's a bunch of money, go, go, go. And the other years where you're like, you've got to pull that money back. And you're uh -huh. sitting here just scratching your head going, okay, I, I just got, I got to do, I, I got to <laughs> do what the, you know, what, and, and like I said, I, I do think that our, um, you know, VF Corp, the company that owns us, I actually think they're a really good company. I think they've got really high ethics. They treat their employees pretty well, but I mean, it's, it, there's, other brands are struggling with within the VF Corp portfolio at certain from in certain time frames, and so you have to kind of respond to that. You know, and mm -hmm. every never nothing is ever as black and white as it seems. Everything's a little, always a little more nuanced and layered than people think, and that happens with our the footwear company. You know, we have a colorist that quits, and all of a sudden, yeah. you know, we have to scramble for that next season's colors. Mm -hmm. You know, we made we that happened recently. We had a whole season um, a year or so ago where we launched some shoes, and the colors were not vetted out properly because we had someone quit, and all of a sudden the colors that year that that season were not very good yeah and we had a lot of complaints and issues but it, those are the type of things that really affect you have a colorist quit yeah and all of a sudden things can go upside down really fast like we started the conversation with looks matter when people buy shoes right, right. and yeah. so those are those type of nuances that it it, it it's really makes makes running a company like this very difficult but mm -hmm. exciting at the same time it's always for new. sure yeah you don't get bored no you certain. don't get bored there's always something <laughs> always something is there a type of shoe that the customers are, or actually maybe I should back this up because I think this is an interesting piece to the puzzle because it's not like you're just, I mean, you are to some degree selling directly to customers off the website, mm -hmm. but the majority of this is, you know, there's a distributor out there who's going to, or you're going to sell the shoes to a running store mm -hmm. or a, a, another online platform. And they're going to be the ones that are actually engaging with the customer when it comes to here's yep. the shoe, try it on. Um, what is it, how do you balance that between like our customers are asking for this, but when I talk to the buyers at the big accounts, yeah. they aren't wanting that shoe or yeah. how does that work? How it, does you blend all that? It's, no, it's, it's <laughs> nuanced, right? Yeah. I mean, revolution run, you know, uh -huh. um, which I, unfortunately I think they went out of business. You know, if they ask for something and REI asks for something, yeah. you know, REI has got like 160 doors, right, and, you yeah. know, they do massive volume. So it, it is, there's always a balance there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's always a balance and, um, you know, how do we do what our, consumers want that have been with us for 10 years and how do we say when rei asks us for something with 160 doors mm -hmm. you know we're usually going to say yes and so that's why a lot of these options are there that's why we have as many SKUs as we do that's why we you know we launch with the instinct and a few months later we launched the lone peak that's how you go from a road one road shoe and one trail shoe to you know six trail shoes and yeah. seven road shoes right uh -huh. with multiple colors and widths and you know that's that's how that happens yeah so what I'm hearing is if you have a complaint, go complain to Fleet Feet and REI. Don't Honestly, complain. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's actually, you know, there's actually some truth to that, Yeah, you know, and you know, as we, we, you know, we started at a, a running, running store called Runner's Corner. It's a one door mm -hmm. store, it, it, medium sized, right? But a single door in Utah, right? Small market, medium sized door. And so how does Ultra continue to listen to that person too? Yeah. And that's something that we have tried really hard to do is yes, obviously REI and Fleet Feet are, are big players and movers, um, but Ultra has always been about uh, independent run specialty. That, mm -hmm. that is who our, that's who we like to think of as our most core consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and finding that balance is hard. And I think that, um, uh, it's nuanced. It's yeah. difficult. And you have to try to balance it all. But I think we've done a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. And I think I've said that like 20 times now already. Yeah. I, you know, it's like, but that's, that's, just, that's just the truth of it, right? Right. It's, it's you do the best you can. Yeah. Um, and I can look back on say, hey, I messed up here and here and here. But I think I've, I'm really proud of my efforts, uh, efforts of the brand and, you know, trying to find that balance. Um, it's never easy. Right. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I think, it, I wonder too, just with like Fleet Feed and REI, they've got such a big customer base between the two of them. I would imagine there's some synergy between like the more smaller mom and pop shops customers sort of having similar, like 
their data pool of customer needs can't be too far away from like a smaller shops to some degree, unless it gets real specific. I would think there'd be more difference between those two specific brands where REI is more like probably trail based, yep. outdoor based. Yep. And the color and the color schemes that they want, REI mm -hmm. does tend tend to want more earthy colors. Yeah. Right? Run yeah. especially does like the brights, the, uh -huh. the bright colors more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you, you, you know, as a brand, um, you listen the best you can and you make the best decisions with the information um, and the situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. Yeah. Last question or topic before I let you go. Um, one thing I find really interesting about Ultras because there's this big education piece to that brand mm -hmm. because like we talked about for a good portion of this interview, they're different. They've yeah. been different. We talked about how there's there. it's not just you directly to consumer necessarily. It's not you always educating consumer. How hard is it to get on the same page with running stores and the employees they have in terms of this is the message we want to get out that we think is going to be attractive. So someone will even bother putting our shoe on and then them actually like sharing that message the way you want it to be shared. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's part of why I'm here in Austin, Texas, right? Is yeah. we have this huge trade show where all these run specialty accounts are coming in from all across the country. Um, we're going to pitch them, right? Mm -hmm. Our fall 2024 product line products that are launching next May to next September. Um, and then we're going to listen to their feedback mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's, um, you know, trying to listen, uh, while you're trying to tell a story, it, it's always this delicate balance because we're trying to pitch them our ideas mm -hmm. and then they give us their feedback and it takes us six months to a year before we're going to talk to them again. Yeah. And so there's always this delay on that information, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they give us this information, we go back, we huddle up, given the circumstances, we make the best decisions and so forth. So, you know, uh, I love the running event for that reason because it's really a gauge for us to see how well we listened six months ago or 12 oh, yeah. months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we've won more times than we haven't here at the running event telling that story and giving that pitches um, and getting that feedback from them is um, it's awesome because most of the time they've been like, oh, we've been asking for that for years. Yeah. This four millimeter drop shoots, I have heard it for 10 years at the running. <laughs> Literally 10 years. Yeah. And um, I'm going to show up and they're going to be like, finally, you listen to us. Yeah. Um, and a few people will be upset. Oh, you guys sold out. And, right. you know, and you just point them to the original. Yeah. Models. You just, you, just <laughs> you know, you, you, you take, you know, you take your punches and you roll with it and um, uh, you go back, you learn, you grow and you just become better. And, um, you know, that's what awesome. I try to do. You got anything else you want to share or did I squeeze it all out of you? I think you got, I think you did well. <laughs> I, you know, I think that, that it's such a great industry to be in, right? Uh -huh. uh, I think health and wellness um, is so important and I, it's just an absolute honor to be in the industry and to have Ultra, um, to be as influential in the industry as possible, to keep people healthy, to keep people running, to help people stay out there, uh -huh. right? That's our new tagline, stay out there. And yeah. I love that because whether you're, fishing <laughs> yeah. or, or, or hunting or running or walking, we want you to stay out there. And, um, I, th I think that that's something that one of those, uh, marketing stories that we've listened to and, and what is important to people mm -hmm. and what do they value above everything else? And it's about staying out there, right? Mm -hmm. Health wise, mental health wise, etc. And I think that that's where Alter is right now. And, um, just love, love, love being a part of the industry and being part of Ultra and, uh, nowhere else I'd rather be. Perfect. Where can listeners find you? And then I'm going to add an extra final bonus question. Where can a listener buy one of your flies? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Uh, so we'll go full I mean, circle back to fly yeah, fishing. <laughs> I, you know, in, 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 Instagram, Brian underscore ultra. Um, I also have ultra fly fishing, uh, which is my fishing Instagram. And then I do, I do go down to South America, um, and fly fish. And I developed a whole line of flies, uh, at night. I can't sit still very well. I pick my nails and I fidget and I, yeah. it's, it's just a curse. I guess and it's a blessing, a curse, I guess, pros and cons. Um, but I do have a website called Payara fly fishing.com P A Y A R A Payara. Um, and that's a type of fish down in South America. They're called the vampire fish. So you can go to my website. You can see a bunch of my South American adventures. Um, and I tie flies, develop flies, have other people time for me. And it's just a little side hustle. Um, you know, I like to say that my day job's ultra at night. I tie flies and on the weekends <laughs> I go fly fishing. Right on. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of information there, but, uh, super awesome to have you on. And Zach, you've been, you know, back at you a little bit. You've been such an awesome athlete and promoter of us. And, and I'm so grateful that, um, 
uh, you've been an athlete of ours, an employee, and just, just the great guy that you are. So thanks for having me on. Absolutely. It's been fun. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years, but <laughs> right. here we are. Right? Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. All right, everyone. If you're still here, you're sticking around to hear about how I use the show sponsor Element Electrolytes and Delta G Ketones. For Element, they make an electrolyte supplement. So what I know about me is that I lose 614 milligrams of electrolytes per liter of fluid loss. So what that means is if I go out for a run and I lose two liters of sweat, then I'm also going to lose roughly 1,228 milligrams of electrolytes with it, which ironically happens to be about one packet of element. So what I likely will do is if I'm going out for a longer training session or I'm going to be out in the heat and sweating a lot, I'm going to supplement the fluid intake I have with electrolyte to make sure I have that stuff in balance. The way this usually looks for me is I'll wake up in the morning and I'll have a cup of coffee and I'll put half of one of those packets in with my coffee. It will be one of their chocolate flavors though because it's coffee after all. I'm not going to stick one of the fruity flavors in there. So that gets me kicked off. Then what happens is I go out for the workout and then I am drinking basically to thirst, but I am also targeting some numbers at times when it's hot enough and I know what my sweat loss is. But generally speaking, for every liter of fluid I'm taking in, I'm matching that with 614 milligrams of electrolytes to make sure I'm staying on top of that and remaining hydrated throughout that training session. If you're interested in a deep dive and figuring out more about your fluid loss and electrolyte needs, I actually have a couple podcast episodes that might be interesting to you. One is episode 358 with Andy Blow, where I go over all things hydration. And he talks about how I came up with that 614 milligram loss number and how you can maybe find out about yours as well as how much fluid you are losing with some simple at-home tests. Also, I did an episode a while back, episode 300, which is just titled Personalizing Workout Hydration. So check out both of those if you're interested in doing a deep dive into your hydration and electrolyte needs. Something new I added to my training and racing this year are exogenous ketones. The research for exogenous ketones is still in its early stages, but there is a lot coming out and it is getting more convincing in my opinion to the degree where I wanted to try it out. I actually stress tested it during a 15 hour 100 mile run at the Rocky Raccoon 100 earlier this year as a way to confirm whether it was something I was going to include in my racing protocol. One thing I was a little nervous about with exogenous ketones, like I am with anything I'm ingesting during an ultra marathon, is what is it going to do to digestion. I was interested in the recovery research for some time now with exogenous ketones, and there are some newer research studies now that suggest it could also have some performance applications as well, if you're able to tolerate it and get it in the right dose. So when I decided to try it out, I went with Delta G ketones because they are the ketone ester that basically all the research that has promising effects is tied to, and it's their formula that's being used in those research studies. So a lot of times you'll just go and look for an exogenous ketone, and there's all sorts of potential issues with that, whether it's a dosage or just the incorrect type, and it's not actually gonna do what the research suggests it would do. So to me, it was looking at if I want to potentially get the benefits that these could be bringing, I need to be using the one that they're actually showing the research with. So that was Delta G ketones. They actually received the DARPA funding and grant to actually put together that form. So like I said in the, the intro message, they have 50 plus published studies and are part of 20 plus ongoing studies. My protocol with this right now, and this is something where I am evolving as I kind of do more with it, but at the moment, I'll do a bottle of their ketone performance, Delta G performance, and that is their little blue bottle. So I'll take one of those about 20 minutes before a big key training session, and that's it. If it's a race day though, I'll do that same protocol, but I will take another bottle about every three hours after that. So if I'm doing something that's longer duration, like that 15 hour Rocky Raccoon effort I've just described, I would be doing that again at three, six, nine, and 12 during that particular performance. So like I said in the intro, if you want to chat with one of their experts, you can actually go to deltagketones.com and they have a consultation service there right now where they will help you understand the research and whether your lifestyle is even something that they would, they would be worth considering it for. So if you want to get a little more information on that, that option is available to you. 
links to both Delta G ketones and element electrolytes can be found in the show notes as well as at zachbitter.com forward slash HPO sponsors. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 